Hello friends and welcome to Escaping the Mouse with your host, me, Breck Roll. All right, today is kind of an important milestone episode today. This is episode 365. Now, normally that would mean that it's been one year since I've started vlogging, but the truth is for the first month or so when I was vlogging, I wasn't vlogging every day. So it turns out the actual one year anniversary was April 4th, because that was the one year anniversary when I posted my first vlog. But doesn't matter, this is 365, so while we've been doing it a little bit more than a year, I now have a year's worth of episodes. So I decided I want to do something important for this one. Um, when I came to Waco, Texas, I knew of three reasons that people would have heard of Waco. Number one, Dr. Pepper was invented here. Number two, Chip and Joanna Gaines, of course. And number three, one of the darker moments of this city's history, the Waco Siege from 1993. And today I have decided that I am going to go visit the location and we're going to talk about it and what happened there and we're going to show you you know, the memorials that are still there. And uh, let's just see what, what comes of this. This is gonna be very interesting. All right, so we are about 13 miles east of Waco. Waco is kind of over there right now, just kind of a, down in kind of an old uh, nothing uh, country road here. And we run into the Branch Davidians compound. Yeah, this is where it is. All right, so the Branch Davidians actually do have a, uh, still have a presence on the site, and there are Branch Davidians that still live here, which is kind of interesting. So you got a few houses around here. Uh, and the actual site of the uh, compound is down the road here a little bit, so it's actually over there a little bit. So we're going to go over there and take a look. Let's do a little history of the, the whole movement here so you can kind of see how we got to where we are. The Branch Davidians kind of evolved in the 1950s from a Davidian religious group uh, founded by a man named Richard or Victor Houtif. Houtif founded the uh, Davidians based on a prophecy of an imminent apocalypse and the, fuck, and the second coming of uh, Jesus Christ. A few years later in 1959 they moved to this site and we're actually at the location now where the compound was. This was a, this is really one of the only things that survives uh, from the siege. This whole area was the area where everything was here. And this used to be a swimming pool. And it's uh, visible from some of the pictures in the area. Right now, like I said, it's the only thing that survives of the original compound, which was all in this area here. So after they moved to this location uh, and Victor Houtif passed away, his widow picked up and continued on with the with uh, running the church. And the the belief at this point was that the prophecy was still imminent and that the second coming was going to happen any time. So a lot of the followers moved to this location and they built houses and some of them lived in their cars and some of them just lived in tents waiting for waiting for the second coming. Now, after the second coming failed to materialize, the, uh, the site was transferred to Benjamin Roden, uh, who was a founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Association. He promoted a different doctr doctrinal belief than Houtef had. And, on, uh, and after Roden's death, control fell to his wife, Lois. Now Lois considered her son George to be unworthy to pick up the mantle, so she began grooming a young man named Vernon Howell. Now we'll note we'll learn more about Vernon Howell at some point because he later changed his name to David Koresh. In 1984, there was there was a meeting between the, some of the different uh, factions, and Vernon Howell, uh, who would later become David Koresh, led one of those factions and called himself the Branch Davidians. And then George Roden, led the uh, rejected son of Lois, uh, led another faction. After the split, uh, George Roden ran Howell and his followers off the Mount Carmel site at gunpoint and Howell and his group relocated to Palestine, Texas. 
after the death of uh, Lois Roden and probate of her estate in 1987, Howell attempted to gain control of the, Mar uh, the Mark Mount Carmel Center by force. George Roden had dug up the casket of one Anne Hughes from the Davidian Cemetery and challenged Howell to a resurrection contest to prove who was the rightful heir to the leadership. Howell went to the police and claimed Roden was guilty of corpse abuse, but the county prosecutors refused to file charges without any proof. Now, on November 3rd, 1987, Howell, David Koresh, and seven armed companions tried to get into the Mount Carmel Chapel with the goal of photographing the body in the, cab in the casket as evidence to incriminate. Roden was informed of the interlopers and opened fire. The Sheriff's Department responded within 20 minutes into the gunfight during which Roden had been wounded. Sheriff Harwell got Howell on the phone and told him to stop shooting and surrender. Howell and his companions, dubbed the Rodenville 8 by the media, were tried for attempted murder on April 12, 1988. Seven were acquitted and the jury was hung on Howell Koresh's verdict. The county pr uh, prosecutor did not press the case further. On August 5, 1989, Howell released the New Light audio tape in which he said he had been told by God to procreate with the women in the group and establish a house of David of his special people. He, in, he involved separate married couples in the, into the group who had to agree that only he could have sexual relations with the wives and the men should observe celibacy. Howell also said that God had told him to start building an army for God to prepare for the end days and the salvation of his followers. On May 15, 1990, Howell filed a petition to the California State Supreme Court in Pomona to legally change his name for publicity and business purposes to David Koresh. On August 28th, he was granted that petition. Shortly after that, the ATF had obtained a search warrant on suspicion that the Davidians were modifying guns to have a legal automatic weapon uh, capability. A former Branch Davidian member claimed that Koresh had had uh, M16 lower receiver parts, which is illegal because it can be used to modify other uh, semi-automatic weapons and to make them fully automatic. And that's a violation of, uh, of the Firearms Protection Act of 1986. Between June of 1992 and February of 1993, evidence began coming in implying that illegal firearms were stockpiled on the property. In June of 1995, a postal worker informed the sheriff of McLennan County that he believed he had been delivering explosives to the ammo and gun store owned and operated by the Branch Davidians. The McLennan County Sheriff was notified in May and June of that year of two cases of inert grenades, black powder, 90 pounds of powdered aluminum metal, and 30 to 40 cardboard tubes. Another report was made to the sheriff in November of 1992 by a local farmer believe he heard machine gun fire on the property. The ATF had planned their raid on Monday, March 1st, 1993, under the code name Showtime. The a ATF later claimed that the raid was moved up a day to February 28th, 1993, in response to a Waco Tribune Herald story, The Sinful Messiah, which uh, kind of painted the uh, Branch Davidians in a negative light. The ATF attempted to execute their search warrant on Sunday morning, February 28, 1993. Now, any advantage that might have come from a surprise attack by the ATF, however, was blown when a local TV reporter who had been tipped off about the raid asked for directions from the U.S. Postal Service mail carrier, who coincidentally was David Crush's brother-in-law. Survivors of the original siege claimed that uh, as they got out, Kresh had ordered select males to begin arming themselves and taking up defensive positions, while the women and children were told to take cover in their rooms. Kresh told them he would try and speak to the agents, and whatever happened next would depend on the agents' intentions. The ATF arrived at 9.45 a.m. in a convoy of civilian vehicles containing uniformed personnel and SWAT-style tactical gear. 
The ATF agents stated that they heard shots coming from within the compound, and while Branch Davidian survivors claimed the first shots came from the ATF agents outside, a suggested reason may have been an accidental discharge of a weapon, possibly by an ATF agent, causing the ATF to respond with fire from automatic weapons. The reports claim that the first shots were fired by the ATF dog team sent in to kill the dogs in the Branch Davidian kennel. Within a minute of the starting of the raid, Branch Davidian Wayne Martin called emergency services pleading them to stop the shooting. What's 911? What's your emergency? There are 75 men around our building and they're shooting at us in Mount Carmel. Tell them there are children and women in here and to call it off. On the east side of the compound, agents hauled out two ladders and set them up against the side of the building. Agents climbed onto the roof with the objective of, of securing it to reach David Crush's room where the arms were stored. On the west side of the roof, three agents reached David Crush's window and were crouching beside it when they came under fire. One agent was killed and another wounded. The third agent scampered back to the peak of the roof and joined the other agents attempting to enter the arms room. The window was smashed, a flashbang stun grenade was thrown in, and three agents entered the arms room. When another tried to follow them, a hail of bullets penetrated the wall and wounded him, but he was, but he was able to reach the ladder and slide to safety. An agent fired with a shotgun at the Branch Davidians until he was hit in the head and returned by return fire and killed. Inside the arms room, the agents killed a Branch Davidian and discovered a cache of weapons, but they came under heavy fire. Two were wounded. As they escaped, the third agent laid down covering fire, killing a Branch Davidian. As he made his escape, he hit his head on the wooden support beam and fell off the roof, but survived. The agent outside provided him with cover fire, but was shot by a Branch Davidian and killed instantly. Dozens of ATF agents took a, uh, cover, many of them behind Branch Davidian vehicles, and exchanged fire with the Branch Davidians. The number of ATF uh, wounded increased, and an agent was killed by gunfire from the compound as agents were firing on Branch Davidian perched on the water tower. An exchange of fire continued, but for about 45 minutes into the raid, the gunfire began to slow down as agents began to run low on ammunition. The shooting continued for about two hours. ATF agents con established contact with Koresh and others inside the compound after they withdrew, and the FBI took control as a result of the deaths of federal agents. At first, the Davidians had telephone contact with the local media, and Koresh was giving telephone interviews. But the FBI cut Davidian communication with the outside world. For the next 51 days, communication with those inside was by telephone by a group of 25 FBI no negotiators. Now in the first couple days, the FBI honestly thought that they were on a good track to end this whole thing peacefully. David Koresh had agreed that in exchange for making a national broadcast to the country, he would uh, surrender peacefully. And in fact, his national broadcast was actually made. My name is Dave Koresh. I'm speaking to you from Mount Carmel Center. The first thing that I would like to introduce in our subject is the reasons for the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, commentary states, so what John has written in Scripture is nothing other than the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Then David Koresh changed his mind and said that God had told him to remain in the compound until, until this thing was resolved. Despite this setback, soon afterwards, negotiators managed to facilitate the release of 19 children, ranging in age from about 5 months to 12 years old, without their parents. However, 98 people remained in the building. The children were interviewed by the FBI and Texas Rangers, some for hours at a time. Allegedly, the children had been physically and sexually abused long before the standoff. This was the key justification offered by the FBI for launching the tear gas attack to force the Branch Davidians out of the compound. As the siege wore on, two factions developed within the FBI, one believing that negotiating was the answer and the other force. 
increasingly aggressive tactics were used to force the Branch Davidians out. For instance, sleep deprivation of the inhabitants by all means of all by means of all night broadcasts of recordings of jet planes, pop music, chanting, and even the scream, screams of rabbits being slaughtered. Outside the compound, the FBI began arming up with tear gas and uh, all-terrain vehicles in case things turned ugly. Armored vehicles reportedly drove over the grave of Branch Davidian Peter Gent despite protests from the Branch, from the Branch Davidians and the negotiators. Two of the three water storage tanks on the roof of the main building had been damaged during the initial ATF raid. Eventually, the FBI cut all power and water to the compound, forcing those inside to survive on rainwater and stockpiled military MREs. The final assault took place on April 19, 1993, because the, and because the Branch Davidians were heavily armed, the FBI hostage rescue team arms included 50 caliber rifles and armored combat engineering vehicles, CEVs. The CEV used explosive to punch holes in the walls of the buildings so the, of the compound so they could pump tear gas in and try and force the Branch Davidians out without harming them. The stated plan called for increased amounts of gas to be pumped in over two days to increase the pressure. At around noon, three fires broke out almost simultaneously at different parts of the building and spread quickly. Footage of the blaze is broadcast live by television crews. The government maintains the fires were del deliberately started by the Branch Davidians, but some Branch Davidian survivors claim that fires were accidentally or delib deliberately started by the assault. Only nine people left the building during the fire. The remaining Branch Davidians, including children, were either buried alive by rubble, suffocated, or shot. Many were killed by smoke or carbon monoxide inhalation and, others ca and other causes as fire engulfed the building. According to the FBI, Steve Schneider, Co Koresh's top aide, shot and killed Koresh and then himself. In all, 76 people died. A large concentration of bodies, weapons, and ammunition was found at the bunker storage room. So this is like the main sanctuary now that appears that it was built on the site of where the original compound was. I see that there's a little, this little monument out in front here. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56, 7. On behalf of all Branch Davidians, we wish to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to the many volunteers and benefactors who have faithfully answered the Spirit, the Spirit's call to rebuild upon the ashes. May the Lord bless you all. We declare this tabernacle to be a house of prayer for every nation, kindred tongue, and people. The Branch, the Lord of, of our righteousness, and then something I can't read. And then there are a couple of monuments along here uh, for some of the fallen here in remembrance of all of the men, women, and children who were victimized and brutally slaughtered by the bombing of the Oklahoma City building on April 19th, 1995. We pray that they and their families find comfort and peace in our Lord. Yeah, see that, that that's all tied to this too. You remember, uh, one of the reasons that Timothy McVeigh said he uh, bombed the Oklahoma City building was in retaliation for this. And if you and if you look at the date, the uh, the date of the Oklahoma City bombing was two years to the day after the Waco siege. Okay, and then here's another monument in memory of the B B A T F officers who lost their lives on February 28th, 1993. Those are the four officers there. Conway LeBlue, Todd McKeon, Robert Williams, and Steve Willis. Yeah, those are the four officers that died uh, when they first attempted to serve the warrant on the Branch Davidians. And here's another monument here uh, dedicated to rebuilding uh, on the site. And it also has a uh, Bible verse. Uh, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and how they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge them and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So up front here by the main gate uh, is a monument, basically 
giving memorial to the founders of the uh, of this movement uh, from the beginning Ellen White, Alfonso Jones, Elliot Wagner and then remember we were talking about Victor Houtif and then we got into the Rodins, Benjamin and Lois and then eventually how she, uh, Lois decided not to support her son taking up the movement but then began be, uh, grooming someone named Vernon Howell who would later change his name to David Koresh yeah so that's a monument to him and then below here are the names of all of the victims of that from that day look at all the children Abigail Martinez, age 11, Joseph Martinez, age 8, Audrey Martinez, age 13, it wasn't just the adults that died in this, Hollywood Sylvia, age 2, Crystal Barrios, age 3, Isaiah, Isaiah Barrios, age 4, Mark Wendell at the bottom there, age looks like 10. Chanel Andrade, age one. And then you get over here, it's interesting because Bobby Koresh, that's one of David's kids, obviously. And Star Howell, remember it was Vernon Howell, so that's one of his kids, that's one of his kids, that's one of his kids. You know, yeah, a bunch of these kids, because, uh, David Koresh was having having kids with at least four different women at the time. And so we're beginning to see, you know, how a lot of that happened here. And the evidence is all around us about how that happened. On February 28, 1993, a church and its members known as Branch Davidians came under attack by the ATF and FBI agents. For 51 days, the Davidians and their leader, David Koresh, stood proudly. On April 19, 1993, the Davidians and their church were burned to the ground. 82 people per, uh, perished during the siege. 18 were children under 10 years of age. And that's all the names there. All the howls and all the crushes are together there. And of course, this is the road here where the media would have been uh, staged when they were monitoring this whole event. Looking over there where that church uh, is, that's where all the action was happening. So yeah, this is where it all happened right here. So that, I think, is the conclusion of our video today on the Waco Siege in 1993. I hope you found this interesting and a little bit entertaining finding out how all this happened and kind of the background and all that. Um, I knew I was going to cover this story at some point because, you know, hey, it's one of the three things that Waco is known for, right? So anyway, I think that's all that I have for today. Thank you as always for watching, and I will see you next time on Escaping the Mouse. Good night.